good morning everyone so without making any delay i request the vice council please come on to the dais and take the chair so this time as you all know the vrsi sessions have been designed in such a way that the time for the talk is slightly uh, less and it has been divided in such a way that we get more time for discussion so i request all the audience to please actively participate send your questions either through that qr code or please take the mic and be ready before the talk is over so that uh, you can make your comment or you can ask your questions and i request uh, my vice vice consul to please keep your thoughts or your points ready and have a crisp comment so that we can stick to the time i know you're all very well versed with your uh, topics and you will keep to that but i still request so that we can uh, complete our session on time and today we have uh, dr hasan motada he's virtually joining us as a panelist so uh, dr hasan motada can you hear us can you see the slides can you see his live video dr upak please can start your Very good morning. Can we have Dr. Rupak's slides, slides, please? Can we? Go back. Go back to the first slide. Bounce and next right. This is this is a, a situation when you always look for if I get wish to get a second chance. So let's see key why I need for a second chance. What mistake I did? Next, next slide, please. Otherwise, please give me the access to do it for me. Please play the video. Any audio visual person can come here. Is it being displayed on that laptop? Yes, yeah, sir. Please, can we take it? Fine. Thank you. Can you make this slide enable editing? It's already done in the preview room, and it was working well there. Yeah. So let's move on to our uh, slide. So this is a very old video when uh, this was a case of macular hole surgery and. Uh, uh, when when the core vitrectomy was done and was planning for doing the PVD induction, it was a very sticky vitreous, which was uh, you know stained with triamcinolone and was trying to remove those vitreous and to loosen it out was you know took long time. And then over a period of time, you get little you know impatient and try to do it as fast as possible, and then you become a little more forceful to do the thing. And Uh, you did the mistake. Accidental touch to the retina in the peripapillary area and created a break. It has been repaired, but yes, the damage has already been done. So this is another situation when uh, there is a sublaxated lens is there and planned for lateral fixation lens. So a thorough vitrectomy was being done. The central part was cleared properly. 
but there was in the peripheral retina was this is the myo uh, patient so peripheral retina was a little sticky and it was very difficult for uh, for that peripheral retina to uh, you know take it out was shaving was done almost uh, 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 completely as much as possible but then i was trying to you know uh, fill the rest of the part of the peripheral retina induce the pvd in the in that area but again when after shaving when you are very close to the retina and then you are trying to take those shaved vitreous and the pvd induction and you will end up of an accidental retina so wish i wish i could get a second chance to reverse it back and then you know rectify it this is this is the case presentation for me i open it up to the panelist thanks dr rupak for this presentation so i'll open up with this discussion with uh, dr hemant murthy sir so one thing is uh, first question i want to ask you is pvd induction is it a must in cases of drop dye well drop nuclear i would uh, prefer to do pvd induction once you're inside try to do as good a vitrectomy as possible rather than leaving especially because now the lens would have a lot of vitreous attachment to it unless you it you're not going to it out i would probably like to do because it saves you from future the formation of erms and other things that comes in but the care that you need to take is for the beginners i would suggest use a contact lens if you feel that when you do the initial part of pvd induction have a challenge use a contact lens gives you much better depth perception as with time i think with practice you can do it with wide angle and makes it a lot easier for you to that manish uh, what do you think was an issue is it the visualization system which is going to because of the technique or sometimes the patient can be not cooperative how do you troubleshoot what will be your tips to prevent the instrumental uh, touch one thing system would be what one is used contact non was i contact the nearby it but anything but i feel it's awareness here it's not about it's about that you have a good when constantly aware of the depth or there is at time sin alone sometimes uh, when it goes in it goes deeper than the time sin alone stain and at times you don't so that special awareness all the time that there is your cutter edge and constantly where that you need a good goes hand in hand because if the patient suddenly moves or, or there is some other thing happening that's a different issue altogether Why is I think? Dr. Narish, what will be your tips for PVD induction in difficult situations? When do you inject tricot? Like, what is the end point? You say, like, okay, I've done this much of vitrectum. Now I will use tricot. Then how will you go about it? Injection with a cutter or manual? How do you decide? The uh, vitrectum. Don't do it for I remove or fix. Some question. Also, no, it does not uh, damage the macular retina. Number one, number two. Like, don't uh, trim completely closer to the retina. Is some here yeah, so that we'll have a hold when you are using. We call uh, the cutter or the injection needle when we use. Number three, especially in pediatrics and mobile retina, it is difficult. So, what we use is either tricot or a BB. Injected under the PF seal after flattening the retina with the PF seal. Thanos, we call it as I think one of our fellows uh, named it as Megavis. Then named it as Megavis. We have published that. Just uh, hook it with uh, Thanos. You can make a small membrane. Feel it comes actually. So and the tricot is a must for us. I tell our fellows also must for especially in case of uh, diabetics. I think can never be seen. When two three times done, that you have to use. But Narsi, uh, what will be your tip for the big, the young surgeons? What should be the magnification, or like how, how do you say like okay, I have adequate visualization, prevent instrument, not just in PVD induction, in any other case. Induction, my teach that of course visualization, magnify the uh, so that you can see the capillary. Well, the problem here was that there was a lot of vitreous 
time cell will go on network well to see my it would be to do a little bit of vitrectomy core vitrectomy first make sure that there is not too much of it left over the disc here then try to do the pvd uh, my teaching is to my fellows is that make sure that your cutter is at the edge of the disc so you can exactly catch the uh, vitreous uh, your cutter now, i don't allow them to do reduction anywhere else except at the disc margin that also only either nasal or superior that way the risk of having hydrogen is much less you can actually when the uh, pull cutter cutter port you can once you see that then you up that way chances of however there will be still some learning curve in the beginning but if you stick to the technique problems will before we uh, go further into the discussion can i have my next speaker dr deepika katoch is the hey can i make a comment uh, madhu sure yeah. see the problem is uh, i think for the beginners i always tell my fellows the eye is a curve so always learn that it's a curve you see it in good i you see it as a flat surface but actually there is a curve so as you move towards the periphery you have to learn to move the cutter away the retina so you have to go along the curve which is where the touches occur especially when you're peeling anything the tendency is to start going at the same level need to start going up because it's a curve one one more the times we call the times we the fusion pressure when you apply this very high suction there can be an imbalance in a very gradual hypotony momentarily which again can play with the curve of the eye and it's your is there and you suddenly aspirated and eyeball has slightly rise in the touch but all while doing a, a test run on the suction it with just that pressure for doing is that will not come in your way of causing some i'll ask uh, our uh, uh, guest panelist dr hasan motada can you please comment on tips for preventing these Uh, complications of instrument touch. Uh, thank you for the uh, kind invitation, and I always like to be with the, your society. Uh, I have um, some comments on uh, the technique. Um, first, I do not use trimes in alone um, at the beginning. So I try because if you inject trimes in alone, especially in high concentration, as done in the previous video, it will cover the retina and you cannot see the behavior of the underlying retina while detaching the posterior hyaloid. So I start by doing posterior hyaloid without the use of trimes alone. And I start on the um, temporal or the nasal edge of the uh, optic disc and applying the suction and then I elevate the probe uh, and I like to see the spreading wave Uh, over the retina and i keep uh, watching the underlying retina the behavior of the underlying retina while the posterior hyaloid is being detached after detaching the posterior hyaloid and i'm sure it was done safely i inject trimsinolone also my comments is that the injected trimsinolone was of high concentration a lot of trimsinolone was injected the particles of the trimsinolone was Uh, were big so i like to use a, a, a less concentration diluted prime alone and then um, there may be islands of hyaloid still adherent to the underlying retina and then i deal with this either with the uh, tissue manipulator or with the can scraper um, in order to avoid uh, inducing injury to the underlying retina um, while moving to the periphery I, it should be done under wide field i don't use uh, the contact lens i'm using the the ingenuity system so i can have wide of the under of the retina while the posterior hyaloid is being free um, i think this is much better than the limited field of the contact lens so you are aware of what is happening at the retinal periphery while you are detaching the posterior hyaloid because the posterior border of the vitreous base may be posteriorly located so you may not, you may induce 
hydrogenic brakes and even a giant brake, um, if you are limiting your visualization to the posterior pole by, by the contact lens. So I prefer to use a wide field visualization system and I prefer the uh, digitally assisted visualization. Thank you, Dr. Hasmatar, for your comment. So the learning points here will be visualization and keeping the eye straight and to be aware of uh, the eye is not a flat structure. And then as Dr. Manish rightly said, the IOP issues, if there is a hypotenuse, just keep an eye on that. And then coming to the instrumentation, good core vitrectomy or debulbing of the vitreous and very little tricot just to put a single layer, a little layer of, so that it doesn't mask the underlying retina and you are aware of your cutter's proximity to the retina. And PVD induction has to be based on the case, but as Hemant Murthy said, it's always better to induce when you are in doubt that future complications can be prevented. Next speaker, please. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Yansh and all the organizers for this opportunity. So I'll be talking, giving a case uh, of a complication from a procedure that we routine day in, day out in adults and uh, are also now increasingly doing uh, in uh, children with ROPs. This is a case of an anti wedge of surprise, retinopathy of prematurity. Just a brief background, this was a female preterm infant born at 31 weeks with a birth weight of 1810 grams to a COVID positive mother and had his of respiratory distress after birth with HMD and jaundice. Uh, at day 20 of life, an ROP screening done uh, at an, another center revealed a diagnosis of aggressive ROP in zone 1 for which they did laser photocoagulation and an intravitreal ranibizumab. So nothing wrong with that. But this is uh, what they noticed one week after procedure was uh, a break, uh, almost uh, two disc diameters in size within, uh, uh, within the zone 1. Uh, and there was a shallow subretinal fluid uh, located in. So we can have a discussion on what is the possible cause and why did it occur because the media was crystal clear. There was no hemorrhage. There was no needle track. Uh, possibly it could be a pressure jet induced necrosis that led to this followed by contraction of the overlying vitreous. Uh, we can debate on that. Uh, so this was the break. So looking at this, it looks quite innocuous that oh, so what is it? We'll just do a laser around the break. So that's what I did. I did an immediate laser photocoagulation and I also did laser to the avascular periphery and I thought maybe that that would be it. Uh, three days later, we are seeing RPE changes developing around that. Uh, however, uh, uh, within two weeks, we see that the inferior edge of the break is lifted and this is a two-dimensional -dimension, photograph, but the entire posterior pole was like a big bullous retinal, regmatogenous retinal detachment. And we all know who manage children with ROP that a regmatogenous retinal detachment in a case of ROP we know what uh, we go through with that. So how, what do we do about this case? The child at the 37 weeks of postmenstrual age, we have two options either to do a vitrectomy or a scleral buckle. For a buckle, the break is too posterior. So, um, and this is a regmatogenous detachment with an intact hyaloid, impossible to induce a PVD and the issues with the silicon oil tamponade. So I'll just show, uh, uh, I tried a different approach. We manage this case with uh, a radial sponge, a 505 after marking the break and doing a very gentle cryopexy to the posterior margins. A vertical mattress suture was applied and uh, a small segment of a 240 band to support it in position because the, it was critical that the sponge actually supports this break. I did not do any subretinal fluid drainage because the peripheral retina was all attached and lasered and I just did this. Uh, and uh, within three weeks, uh, the retina settled. We can see the indent of the sponge. Uh, this is three weeks and at uh, post PMA of 42 weeks. So all this has played out within 42 weeks of life. The sponge was explanted six weeks after surgery and this is the one year follow up. So just to conclude that retinal break is rarely reported after anti-VGF therapy for ROP and I would like the option for this. Very interesting case, Dr. and very well managed of course. Uh, congratulations on that. So I'll open up the discussion, uh, Dr. Dhanashree, like wh what will be the cause of that break? What will you do? Well, excellent case, well managed. Okay. What I understand is, of course, mechanism is simple, but I think that premature child, the avascular retina, uh, I don't think the avascular retina is still, you know, developing and not very healthy. Probably, as you said, the fluid, uh, you know, currents inside the a vitreous cavity after the injection might have caused some kind of a mechanical damage. So this avascular retina is prone for, uh, you know, damage that might have led to this large break. And uh, once the avascular retina is actually can either cause, uh, you know, further uh, detachment. 
been very well managed. Uh, Samat Moti sir, uh, in, in this kind of uh, young guys, usually the stress is in a gel form. Is it possible for a jet which we inject at the limbus to go and cause a break? I was coming to that. You know, I you see they are much more thicker than what you see in an adult. And we give injections, nothing happens. So in this situation, I wouldn't think jet would be that. It's the jet would be directed towards the nasal quadrant rather than in the temporal quadrant. Right? You would always go you know, towards the core of the eye. So it would go to the nasal quadrant. I I don't think the jet would have caused this. I think it's in the temporal quadrant, possibly needle has gone deeper than what what it should be done, especially because you are doing an ROP. I think that would be the way that one could explain. Jet is probably very... Is it the ischemic retina and because of the anti-VEGF? That, that is, it's anti a... anti it has caused the contracture and that... It's an avascular a retina. So, some drag of the vitreous might have pulled it. That could be a... So, it's probably not so much from the jet, probably other mechanisms that have played. Manish, what will be your indication? Sorry, ma'am. Not just the jet, but the fluid currents. Like if you inject a fluid, fluid inside a gel, it will create some currents inside, some movement of the fluid. That might have caused some uh, change in the fluid. Unlike itself, some hemorrhage, some. So it can't be so innocuous. So, likely, either it's a stretching, fraction, or. So, Dr. Manish, what will be your indications for anti vegf in ROP? I don't the ROPs. Narish? The right I do only surgeries of ROP. Our team takes care of that. Sir? In this case, I just want to make a point. So, we have operated, actually. Uh, the choice would have been people with the uh, oil. After seeing this case, I buckle in. Uh, very nicely. So, uh, just was there any hemorrhage or any vitreous attached there previously? So, vitreous for the injection there on the OCT, we saw that there was this layer of the posterior hyaloid which was like over covering over the break, which we knew that impossible to completely it. And so, there was that doubt whether we dare exchange when we'll do whether we'll be able to drain the fluid. So, there were so many questions that were going on in mind. The intact hyaloid was there, but there was no hemorrhage. Uh, so it's an avascular retina, so possibly you wouldn't get an hemorrhage. Yeah. So it's an avascular retina. But you did a very good thought that because there is a form vitreous there, best is to put a buckle and get away with it. It's the idea. Enable that mic, please. Yeah. By chance, just my idea about you. Sir, we will believe it's just stretched. not in the macula, sir. It's temporal to the macula. Just want because sometimes you need 42 weeks, very young child. Macula is not well defined. And I think the screening, the, uh, when, when it was done, it wasn't noticed. It's the, the thing has occurred after your uh, intervention. Arunan, sir, uh, in your experience, how often have you seen? Um, uh, ROP child after laser or an anti vegf developing a regmatogenous or a combined regmatogenous. Actually, we see the tractional compound. Yeah, we see that, but uh, here in this case, one of the obvious was that there was no obvious uh, fibrous traction or anywhere. Very peculiar. We do cases where breaks develop that because of the fibrotic element. And as I said, in this case, as Naresh said, I would have uh, done for a spectrum. I have done uh, cases where, uh, two cases where without doing the induction, PVD induction, just Air or gas without the oil also it is have settled, but uh, there are cases of failures as well. Uh, as after seeing this, I, I also same my, yeah, my thought process a little bit of uh, very nice, very nice. Can I just share the tips if one has to do a vitrectomy in such case, ROP especially in that particular age group, like three to five months? What are the uh, air which we need to take and the do's and don'ts? What I was feeling was like when you use uh, shave mode in constellation, sometimes the, because it's a very gel vitreous, that sometimes you know, does not give the force required to suck the very gel form. You go, go with the higher uh, suction, uh, like because when you, otherwise you have to go too close and thereby in, increasing the risk of getting a retinoid. The PVD induction, I give a little bit of uh, with a sharp pick. Ankara use that needle induction rather than the for any. That I use, try to induce, if it comes off easily, I try to induce, very difficult, I just.
don't I'm not very aggressive with the uh, PV. Dr. Hassan Matata, can you uh, your comments on this, please? Um, truly, it's a very interesting case, and um, I have seen the, a hole um, in eyes, barely in eyes with ROP, but I have seen it um, in eyes without ROP, just the same uh, picture. Um, I think maybe related to the contraction uh, that may follow the injection of NTV death, um, something like the, the crunch syndrome that occurs after injection, but uh, the contraction of the vitreous uh, resulted in the creation of a, of a hole. I don't think it is related to the, but there is no other signs like hemorrhage or trauma to the underlying choroid. So maybe related to the jet um, uh, also, but, but it may be uh, related to the drug itself, to the NTV death itself. Um, Concerning the management, um, I totally agree with what uh, done. Um, I think steroid buckle, putting a radial buckle uh, is the proper uh, treatment. Uh, I do not attempt uh, to me as a first option in the eyes with very aberrant thyroid. Um, I do not like to inject silicon oil in eyes with uh, ROP. So I think steroid buckle without even drainage, uh, closing the hole um, is proper. Thank you for your comments. Before we before we go to the discussion, can I ask uh, Dr. Manoj Katri to please be prepared for your presentation? Uh, so the 30 gauge needle, just a uh, thought that the 30 you are going through the temporal side and always skeptical that you should not point towards the uh, lens. Be aiming more posteriorly. It could be a possibility that if you are using the 30 gauge needle, almost like uh, one point. Actual length of these eyes is quite low, like 15. There could be a possibility that the needle may have touched. Always skeptical while using the 30 gauge needle. Right. There was no hemorrhage because the, wherever it touches, because it was close to the vascular portion of the retina. It was just odd that there was no hemorrhage. So that's what we are thinking that maybe there would there could be two possibilities. The jet itself or the needle that can Definitely. that could have caused it. One last question, ma'am. So, what is your protocol, Dr. Dhanashri? What is your protocol after giving injections? You go on observing till what time and then decide, like, okay, now I'll do laser. At least the uh, uh, our, our department who does this ROP treatment, but we never do anti -VEGF. The anti VEGF is always followed by uh, laser. When to do laser, probably we uh, depends on when the vascularity reduction allows us to. I think within a week or so, we are proposing it after that. That was an excellent case, a lot of learning points here. So one thing is after giving injection, be prepared for such surprises. But it's just not an, a procedure which is as safe as in, uh, in adults, because again, examination in these uh, kids itself is a challenge. And then as um, she said, follow it up with laser. If you are not equipped with uh, the repeated UA examinations, if you are prepared for that, probably you can do anti vegf alone. And uh, uh, our panel agrees that in this particular case, buckling was better suited than vitrectomy. But at times, if there is a prolif, then you may have to go and do vitrectomy, which has its own challenges. Thank you, Dr. Manoj, please. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I have my presentation on, please. Uh, thank you once again for the kind opportunity. <clears throat> uh, so, couple of cases which have been brought by our uh, trainee consultants and also uh, fellows in training. Uh, so, I thought let me have a uh, uh, opinion from the expert panel here as how they should be going or they should not be making mistakes during the diabetic membrane peeling. So as we are aware, membrane dissection is one of the key steps in getting these challenges cases sorted out. And uh, most often or not, that's a step where we don't know what is the real plane of dissection, visualization, and instrumentation. These are the three main pillars of any uh, membrane surgery, which goes a long way. So let's go a couple of uh, by uh, some cases. This was a just case of a plain vitreous hemorrhage uh, <coughs> with a focal traction. But what the surgeon here was struggling with a visualization. You know, sometimes it was a too magnified view, and sometimes it's a too minified view. And what we can see here, in spite of uh, good illumination which was available, uh, the surgeon was slightly out of focus. 
So one pointer was there. The second one was uh, this case was slightly a uh, little challenging though there was a peripapillary traction to control uh, to start with but there was also focal uh, <coughs> pragmatous retinal detachment component here on the nasal side. But uh, the truncation of cone was not complete and once the truncation of cone was not complete the membrane dissection parts becomes little challenging and also this kind of air fluid pockets which were there stuck behind the intraocular lens or <coughs> pachyic eye uh, can sometimes you know throw up their challenges for visualization. So as we understand segmentation and delamination is the key forward uh, and uh, vitreous cutter can be widely used most often or not. This was again one of my trainee who was doing just using the vitreous cutter but the struggle here was the suction which was not adequate but somehow she was able to manage it over a period of time with just with the help of cutter taking off this membrane diligently. However, <laughs> the only issue here was the time taken was little longer but that's acceptable till the time you don't cause any atrogenic retinal breaks. So this was going on well. The last step which most often are not tend to uh, you know struggle is the air of from unimanual conversion to a bimanual. So this is one of the cases uh, uh, the same <coughs> surgeon who is trying to convert from unimanual to bimanual surgery but not sure at which step to convert, when to convert, whether to start with bimanual itself altogether in this type of cases. We like to hear from the panel. And uh, uh, again here the uh, visualization I feel were not that great, uh, the uh, zoom of the membranes and the you know identifying the vitromacular tra correct traction, where are the planes, what is the uh, uh, vitreous cases, identifying the membrane which are close to the surface of the retina and that was the struggle. Last case uh, for today, uh, again uh, the membrane dissection from the peripapillary region was attempted from uh, uh, the disc. But uh, here there was a component of combined retinal detachment along with a massive subretinal bleed here inferiorly. The visualization here remains slightly poor that's what the initial struggle is but ultimately the surgeon did quite well and over a period of time was able to flatten the retina and attach it. So these are the couple of challenges when to convert to biomanual surgery. So take home messages uh, we need to give pointers on visualization, plane of dissection and tissue handling. Thank you so very much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Before we begin, can I have uh, uh, Dr. Shal Agarwal, please be ready with your, this. So I'll begin the discussion with uh, Dr. Manish. So for a beginner, what will be your suggestion to choose their cases? Like say, either he's doing a fellowship or just out of fellowship. So what, when should he say like, okay, I'll take this and what should be the plan before proceeding with the surgery? No. Of them are, if it's a diabetic case, or you're talking diabetic, 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 oh, diabetic with diabetic. TRD or CRD, the difficult ones. So it's simple hemorrhage, of course, is the best, and I don't think there's from once it goes beyond that to a TRD, except that you need a well-formed membrane, uh, which is not very vascular, would be ideal uh, instead of going to the other end of spectrum, really fibrosed and stuck. So both ends of the spectrum challenging because one will bleed a lot and other will cause a lot of breaks. So it's I think between that spectrum is a good thing where well formed membranes which can control while peeling done easy. Uh, the thing is the visualization. I think it's again for any surgeon to see well then the planes can be determined well. So whatever mode of system one uses. I personally choose the contact based system. Something pre posterior a flat lens otherwise a central is a uh, woke lens works very well. Uh, field which allows you to see how uh, where your plane of uh, membranes are up to. First choice is cutter. Which I use I don't buy manuality that often. Where cutters nowadays can uh, get close and see very well the plane on the zoom. You can cut them flush, uh, releasing the traction. If at all you leave a small stump. I don't think that's a problem. It's mostly the in action that needs to be. Dr. Hemant Muthi, sir. So, if you have a case where it is not lasered, see that the proliferations are mainly on the posterior pole and it is vascularized. So, what will be your choice? Will you give an anti VEGF pre op or you'll do a visible laser to decongest the eye and take it up for surgery or without anti VEGF or lasers, you'll straight away go ahead with the surgery? The vascular component is more, I would prefer to do it. I have anti VEGF and then surgery. Uh, because now, once you do laser, that uh, dissection becomes a little more challenging because you wait for the scarring to occur. Peripheral 
the separation of the vitreous all said and done if the patient's systemic condition is not good and you're waiting anyway for that to settle down i would probably do some laser prior to doing but i would prefer to put anti -vagin. one point about which patient uh, should the fellow take be wherein you don't see much if you see the all the structures very well that means it's an totally adherent vitreous that's where the problem starts in a patient of diabetes when there is no pvd that is where they will face the greatest challenge when they start doing dr narish uh, what will be your tips uh, when do we say like okay i will start using the forceps and scissor and i'll cut a fixation basically what is your your because in a, in an uh, in surgical in, in an surgically expertised hands they can remove it even with the cutter or whatever so for a beginner when do you say like a scissor and forceps is better suited than just cutter alone so I met us a lot. One night, five by six, wait for time experience. I'll wait. I joke. Operate on a five by six. At the end, regarding this, uh, actually, more than this, uh, what you call the scissors and the cutters. Your after seeing this video, I've started to use it. It'll pick really does a wonderful. It's a real wonderful, right? Sir is there, he got that award also. I think every one of us can try that. After lifting, no, then you can go for whether, you, uh, I mean, uh, cutter or if the additions are um, very tough, then we can go for scissors. I personally feel there is no restriction in using any instrument. I use every other instrument, whether it's by manual, even manual, cutter or scissors, but at the end, actually, that my ego will say that I should do nothing. But the needle pick, yeah, wonderful tool. Your suggestions, like the uh, importance of identifying the secondary membrane and getting the plane, that? First of all, uh, never ever underestimate a diabetic vitrectomy. Really challenging and it can bring you to tears. So never ever under, uh, underestimate. Don't be overconfident ever, even if you are experienced. Uh, second thing is, uh, most important is to understand the vitreoretinal relationship. How the vitreous is adherent to the retina is the most important. Many times fellows are doing case, they don't even understand whether the has been in there, which area there is being. So I think it takes a little bit of experience, but you will understand uh, as the, you know, gain more importance, uh, more experience. But it is really important to understand how the vitreous is adherent. And uh, another, what he mentioned is the second membrane, which is again very important. Uh, if you if you can see if you can uh, whenever there is a membrane always try to look for the second membrane and under the second membrane is your correct plane of dissection that is very important third thing is correct technique and correct instruments so i don't uh, i don't advocate using forceps for diabetic uh, peeling at all because it has to be a sharp dissection you cannot have a blunt dissection or a forceps dissection so i generally prefer this uh, because scissors gives a little bit more atraumatic uh, dissection, it uh, kind of crushes the bleeders. But whereas when you do with cutter, it gives a very sharp cut and it can bleed a lot. So I generally prefer scissors. But whatever instrument you are using, uh, whatever you are comfortable with, use in a correct technique. So that will give a better outcome. If for want of time, we'll go to the next. Yes. The learning points here are to choose your, choose the case and uh, preoperatively prepare for the systemic uh, uh, stability and use of anti vegf when necessary. Good magnification, have uh, good instrumentation armamentum with you. Those cutters and the pick or the needle to identify the proper plane and identifying the second membrane being in the right plane matters a lot in these cases. Yes, Dr. Vichal, please. Uh, thank you. I'll be on a uh, number of you know similar uh, pole surgeries and a similar you know intraoperative surprises which have happened you know over the past uh, decade or so in many of the cases not many they are rare still they are curious and they are fascinating because uh, number of surgeries we do on the macula uh, is something very surprising still don't have a clue why that happened so, uh, starting from the first case a few of the cases I presented before also, I've added on the list of the similar complication. This is a routine macular hole surgery and we are doing bead induction, we are uh, doing a routine uh, BBG stained limb peeling with the forceps. Everything is going, you know, uneventfully. It's around 10 years old video. 
can see the cuffer fluid, you know, accumulating uh, beneath the edges of the, the macular hole here. And it, you know, suddenly enlarges. And uh, in this, we were using the non valved car cannula system. And uh, the hole did not close in this case. Second case was pseudophagic macular hole, again a routine surgery. And this is a wide angle view of the surgery. The previous one was an irrigating lens. Again, the pinch and peel technique was applied and surgery was being done. Similarity was just after the peeling, you know, the hole enlargement started. There was a fluid accumulation beneath the hole, and you can see the enlargement and the fluttering of the edges. It's almost like it's a dancing hole. You can see the enlargement. Here I did not do anything else because I did not know what it what it is causing. Just left it under air, up the gas. Luckily for me, this time it closed. The third case of a uh, full thickness macular hole in a pseudophagic eye. Again, in this case, uh, you can just notice that before the peeling starts, the small amount of subretinal fluid beneath the cuff of the macular hole. And this, the uh, similar complication, but the timing is a little different because peeling has not yet started. I did an inverted peeling in this case, and this also macular hole closed. When I thought that everything was over for me and these nightmares will not come again, recently I was operating a taut posterior hyaloid membrane in a diabetic case. This is not a macular hole case, this is an ERM case. And after removing the hole, uh, after removing the membrane nicely, without any you know, macular hole formation, you can see uh, some of the you know, fluid accumulating beneath the hole. Yeah. After uh, I again chained it with BBG just to make sure that the ILM is peeled. After that, you can see the subretinal fluid, cluttering of the Again, no clue what happened. One thing I know now that uh, you don't have to do anything. You just go under air and pull, uh, you know, put gas. The case does fine. In this, surprisingly, you can see the contour, the pre-op ERM and the post-operative uh, you know, contour of the foveates. Absolutely as if nothing has happened. Surgery has been done. There was a quite, quite a lot of you know, disorganization of the inner layers. Uh, and uh, after that, when the fluid went inside, the gas was put. The normal fovear contour of the case. And the patient regained 618 vision. So I don't know, the posterior pull, uh, perhaps the macula was more pliable after traction removal or the fluid misdirected uh, into the separate space after that or any other thoughts by the vice consul. Thank you. Very interesting case, Dr. Vishal. Couple of questions. So what uh, were you using? 23 gauge or 25? Is it not 23? 23 gauge. Was so it the, the, the ERM was uh, 25. The macula holes were 23. Wild or non-wild cameras? Mix of both. Of both. So was it an IOP compensation or it is IOP compensation constellation? All the cases, yeah. all the cases, the last two cases. What was the IOP or put it at? TM. TM. Now I'll open up. Uh, there's this question. First, I'll ask Dr. Hassan Motadak your, uh, your uh, comments on this, please. What could have caused such kind of uh, induced increase and fluttering of the uh, macular hole edges? Um, interesting cases. Um, well, um, I think this is what we call paradox paradoxical behavior of the uh, macular hole. Um, and it is usually encountered uh, when you heal the internal limiting membrane and remove it. And it is rarely encountered in the inverted flap, whether a temporal um, uh, flap or a multi layer flap. Um, so, my recommendations not to. Um, eye lamp peel and remove. You have to perform eye lamp flaps because this is associated with much higher uh, closure of the macular uh, macular hole. So uh, I think this is my recommendation for such cases. Dr. Manish, what could have caused such things? Is it the IOP compensation or is it the non world uh, thing which is causing the so combination of IOP? Compensation in non valved classics where this can happen. But the machine is trying to pump in more, and then time you come out or you know, go in turbulence, uh, which can of course explain like this happening. I have had it sometimes when I'm uh, aspirating closer to the uh, hole, and suddenly it has uh, had a similar situation. I think Tal has seen it also, at, but not uh, without doing anything. Uh, so has to be something with the whole turbulence related to what is coming in and going out and classic situation would be IOP compensation for valves. 
because we have seen this happening in regmatogenous RDs where you come out with an instrument and then the SRF keeps coming out through the port and then the retina goes back on itself, especially after induce the PVD beyond the part of the break. But seeing something in the macula hole which is that far in the fluidics, eating a channel between that because there's no just tag or anything which is connecting macula for this. So Dr. Naresh, any thoughts? One thing, all due respect, uh, I'd like to see the placement of cannula also. The oh, placement of cannula was absolutely fine. Because it no, cannot go wrong in four cases, sir. No, I am just here saying is, actually. Yeah. Because the first case, if it, have, it would have happened, I would have shifted my cannula to the nasal exactly. side. So that the fluid never enters it. Why is it happening in an ERM case? There was no hole there. No, no, the direction of the jet of the fluid from the cannula I am saying. I would like to see that also. All due respect, I would have shifted to nasal side. I have never come across that. The ERM case, I would think there would be some micro break. I mean, maybe it's the appealing. because the, it's a diabetic case, so very thin, friable retina, right. and uh, maybe it's just not obvious because somewhere it has to go through. Is that micro hole is enough, you know, to let oh, the fluid in? Well, that's not common, but I'm just guessing that uh, this has to be something which has opened up to. Before we go further into the discussion, uh, can I ask Dr. Gopal Pillai to take the podium please, Dr. Gopal Pillai. Yeah, we have the our another vice consul, Dr. Rajiv Reddy, please. Please, ma'am. I think uh, after you remove the ILM, the uh, macular hole, the edges become little pliable. So I think that is why they are fluttering like this because of the, the currents in because, uh, you. Uh, the fluid when you are doing gas exchange, it just collapses very nicely. Sometimes you can even massage it and pull. Just because they are loose and they are pliable, they like that. The rest of the retina is well adherent, you know, well attached. So that the only place which is so that's why it uh, amenable to these currents. Yes, sir. The third video, uh, you saw that the, the, the Instagram video, the dimple of uh, R, uh, localized RD was there. The lower part of the RD, there was a dimple because of the jet of uh, fluid. See that, that the lower part of that bubble which you are seeing, that it in, there indicates that the fluid is hitting. Only thing is that normally in MIVS we go through a slanted entry, so the fluid is always directed towards the periphery. But in all your cases, somehow the placement of the, as uh, was clearly pointed out, the placement of the cannula is more vertical so that the fluid is directly to the, the macula. Forward. As uh, Manisha also told that the IOP combination is a very dangerous thing, especially combined with the non-world cannula. It's a, you know, is it possible because the IOP composition system works in such a way that it feels that IOP is not building up? And it so exactly, exactly. More. That's what exactly. sir was saying. Both are a very, very bad combination. So in this particular case, was there some uh, tissue which was stuck in the infusion cannula? Infusion is not adequate. And it is sensing that the IOP is less. Because I no, see but this what happens is here the fluid is continuously coming in. So that will be recognized as a low, I mean, a normal IOP only. There is no fluid coming in, then it may recognize high IOP. But here you can see that there is a continuous jet like going and hitting the macula. And you can, the last case, third case which you showed, you can see the nice dimple happening in the lower part of the press of RD. So, so what, what I was trying to ask was, is it that understood, the, I understood. the sensor, is it? That is very, very, very fast, very fast, it's it not is, slow, yeah. it's not is slow. It pushing, it's for that momentary time, is it pushing it so fast at 80 or 100 IOP? No, that, that Doppler sensor is very fast, it, the response time is very less. I wouldn't uh, expect that to happen in this case. There's a small Why Doppler which is in the mechanical. pressure. Actually, it's the other way around. The sensor is very accurate. It is detecting a leak, it is detecting lowering of IOP because of multiple reasons. Maybe whenever you come out a second, that happens. Or a leaky, even with the instrument, sometimes there is. So, uh, the sensor is actually working accurately and that's why more at time. Oh, but the in, in the older uh, Constellation machines, this uh, sensor was uh, accurate, but it used to uh, compensate very fast. That is why you used yeah. to get breaks with 25 gauge. After doing FG, you used to get breaks. So, after that, then the Constellation, Alcon has done some changes in the fluid gain compensation. Now, we don't face that problem. So, maybe in older machines, that could be the reason. No, one Shall point regarding this IOL compensation is tax. Works only if you are using a fresh cassette. Cassette is reused. Second time, no IOP compensation is happening. I think you can verify with the company also. Only for the 
which cassettes i will composition box not for the reuse charles sure, uh, just one question monitor show did every case have one cannula <coughs> one uh, uh, cannula which was non valve <coughs> in every one of these cases was at least one of the all one three one were valved during oh. the last two cases but they were reuse cannulas so there were some they leak leaking cannulas yes they were they leaking, leaking cannulas leaking. definitely if they were significantly leaking cannulas then this issue of pressure comes in and if the issue of pressure gets com combined with a cannula which is really jet will come then otherwise it won't come you won't get the jet in a even if the if it's valved and even if it's reused but if it's not leaking much if it's leaking profusely then only this will happen is it advisable for at least a maclock k whole cases or erm cases not to go for the iop compensation because what i do because when the, when you peel the ilm uh, the free flap it kind of gets stuck into because of the capillary effect into the forceps so most of my ilm peel i do with iop compensation off so i have not faced any of the is it advisable i don't think as a principle iop compensation is excellent i don't see problem with that and i don't think it happens that often i think these are rare cases and just need to be aware of the situation i think what dr dhanashree said the changes they've done is more for if you are working in air and for some reason you go back to fluid that's when the jet is terrible used to be a, a very piercing jet which they have now changed and has uh, slowed down you know like now we don't face the tears because a lot of people are reporting tears if you switch to fluid from an air filled eye there are lot of learning points here one is know your machine well and know your instruments well if you are using it keep an eye on like what is leaking and accordingly you can either switch off for iop composition or know that you set your fluidics well and uh, yeah be prepared for such sur surprises for the want of time we'll go to the next yeah. yes dr thank Kupai. you thank you very much uh, i would be presenting a case of uh, uh, you know a simple vitrectomy in which pvd is getting induced here uh, triumphs and loan induced induction Pardon me. Oh, it's not coming on the screen. It's not coming onto the screen. Can you please AV video? Yeah. All right. So here is a simple case of vitrectomy where PVD is getting induced right from the disc, and uh, this is triamcinolone stained. No, nothing there. So clean uh, PVD induction there. For want of time, I'm not showing the entire steps. So okay. Now. finish that and uh, we are doing a vitrectomy right till the periphery you can see a retinal detachment is coming from there from inferior area immediate reaction would be to look at the infusion cannula look at the infusion cannula it is well within uh, the uh, vitreous you can see that it is for before itself we had looked at it and it is the vitreous cavity itself it is not subretinal so where is the fluid coming from is it the disease or is it something to do with our own problem So that's the second thing. So we take out the infusion cannula anyway, and I could move it to one of the other ports as well. But here, what I did was I just moved it one millimeter anterior to where, where it was. So uh, I had uh, made another incision about one millimeter anterior to where it was, uh, because it is completely intravitreal also anyway. But I think I should have moved it to another port. Uh, looking back retrospectively, um, and went ahead with the surgery. Uh, I completed the uh, vitrectomy. and slowly the retinal detachment just settled slowly after completing the vitrectomy after removing the uh, uh, that particular area also the retinal detachment slowly then i had an ilm peeling to be done here or some erm and ilm peeling so that was also done that was also completed and then coming back then to periphery so you can see that the almost the retinal detachment is almost settled here you can see the color difference but almost the detachment is settled there and i uh, searched for a break by intending i could not find a break there or a tear but anyway i completed it with uh, a peripheral laser and uh, completed because i did not find a tear i thought the laser was not enough i did a cryo to the extreme periphery as well and uh, you know finished it with air so i am not very sure how the detachment occurred because there was no tear and that uh, and the um, uh, the infusion was completely within the vitreous okay. thank you out for discussion
very interesting case, Dr. Gopal. Uh, just one question, when that happened, did you uh, try to indent from anterior, like till, from the limbus till posterior in each quadrant and see if there is any tiny break? Yeah. A vitreous communicating to the infusion cannula? I tried intending from the periphery to the posterior like that in all those areas where there was a retinal detachment, looking for some dialysis, some tear, some small hole, some micro hole, something, nothing. But then, so I could not localize, so I basically exceed the entire area. When you started vitrectomy, the peripheral vitreous was trimmed or you straight away went to the chip hole in your, this particular case? Yeah, in this particular case, I uh, immediately after a core vitrectomy probably would have gone put in a triumph and long, try to induce the beauty. I, I would not have gone to the periphery at all. Dr. Raju, ready, sir? Comments? Whenever we see some elevation, then some amount already there is a coronal detachment. Out. Tends to go back once you remove the cannula and put it else. Possible. Second possibility is the best detachment like that happening with a small tiny hole is very unlikely unless until there is active push of fluid from cannula inside. Without that it doesn't happen. If that has happened and you are not finding a break, very unlikely. Tiny break, they have pushed it and then stopped there, I am not sure. Yeah, uh, that is the suspicion definitely, but I couldn't find one. Raman Murthy, sir, thoughts on this? I think uh, you, after you changed position, I think it, it settled down more yeah. or less. Yeah. So I think it was going subretinal yes. in the first place. So I think that is there an abnormal anatomical insertion of the aura area or just beyond the aura? And going inside is a question. Was it a hypermetrope? That's see, the question. Is I always tell my fellows to check whether the patient is a myope or a hypermetrope, there would be a small difference in the region of the pars plana. But uh, I think by shifting that, I think he has solved the problem. So that itself says that the cannula must be subretinal in the... This particular case, you induced the PVD till ORR was only limited beyond equator. When did it settle, the retinal detachment? After the induction of PVD or while After you the induction of PVD. Okay, After so induction of PVD and moving towards the periphery and removing the vitreous okay. from okay. that area. Okay. Then it just settled. Dr. Naresh, is it possible that there is some tiny break or a small dialysis, which because with the depression we may not be able to see that kind of the depression, it, it small dialysis closes and once you induce PVD, probably settle back? It can happen without. Uh, at times it happens and it settles actually. So as he rightly said, we cannot find break in such case. But will we see such bullous detachments in yes, a yes. Uh, in a non rachmatogenous uh, retinal detachment? Yes, yes. yes Naresh, I, I have I, also I have seen, seen some small, uh, you know, yeah, small, small uh, vibrations of retina there yes. when we are doing the vitrectomy. But I have not seen this bullous detachment yes. with something like you are telling. Maybe that may be secondarily associated with that. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I also agree that it is probably could be the traction because you are inducing PVD, you know, you are concentrating at the posterior pole, but the traction is actually conveyed to the periphery also. And sometimes when you are pulling the retina, if you are going a little bit towards the mid periphery, the vitreous is very densely adherent, it can pull the retina along with it. And because you are concentrating at the posterior pole, you don't notice it happening at that time. Uh, so it might be because of the vitreous traction. And but if I you have notice seen it that video, ma'am. When we induced the PVD and when we started the vitrectomy, that is not there. And even when my probe was quite posterior, that detachment, bullous detachment kept on, kept on increasing like that. Once it, uh, once the retina gets detached, it will increase because of uh, whatever fluid yeah. currents or yeah. whatever, it will increase to some extent. But the fact that it settled after you have finished doing vitrectomy without anything and you did not find any break, Nulla was inside, so that it has to be because of the traction. So like Rajiv said, it must be that some push mechanism should be there, which is pushing the fluid inside, right? The vitreous which is uh, pulling it inside. Okay. The fluid <laughs> okay. Yeah. Vision? Peter one? Now, actually, I can answer for you why the fluid went away without your draining it. Drained away from that place. Drained out from your uh, from previous, the previous uh, sclerotomy. sclerotomy okay. Because that was not been suited. And it, in fact, uh, for a choroidal detachment, it will always happen. But here, it's a subretinal fluid, but because that area is open, you have a drainage point there, drained out from there. As far as 
bit coming in is concerned, with a 23 gauge with the Prokars is less likely. But I've seen this happening in olden days when we used to have infusion canola straight. What used to happen was when they became old, sometimes they would fracture somewhere at the, at the edges. Then the, would dissect between the retina and the choroid. You could develop a detachment there. So here's, there seems to be some such fracture has happened. Let's just let it shear through between the retina and the choroid. And then moved it out. That was an automatic model. It was automatically it took care of the problem. Because it's not a tear. If it was a tear, you would have seen it. This is actually shearing through at the connection where the uh, cannula, infusion cannula has with the, uh, uh, with, uh, 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 with the retina. Tubing. Exactly okay. at that point. And basically, it is not that the fluid is decreasing. It is increasing. It is not fluid currents. It is actual fluid increasing. Little bit of fluid is getting directed towards the uh, subretinal space. Most of it because the uh, less resistance the vitreous cavity, most is coming into it. Sir, if there is a fracture of such an infusion cannula, if we check it outside with the fluid is coming in, mm. would there be another so, stream? Yeah, but what happens is usually, the drop coming from here, another small drop coming from here is sometimes very difficult to figure out. And check. You will sometimes find that there is a fracture. And second thing is, whenever there is a tear there in a bullous retinal detachment like that, and if you are inducing a PVD there with kind the vitreous, definitely you are going to find the tear if it is there. It is not about intending at all. Yes. So, so, yeah. But the important thing is that, um, well, you took care of it, but be very clear when you start that the cannula is well within the. Sometimes it can also happen that it's right at the edge. It means it's inside, but it's right at the edge. So part of it goes through, then comes out again. We'll get a little bit of bullets of a, a, a bullet of detachment, and then you'll find this come back into its. That's normal. an interesting point. Sometimes when we manipulate the eye, the infusion can retract a little bit and go. They come back. Is, we keep seeing that. Yeah. So be so. careful. So be careful. It's well within the infusion. What happens is we don't bother. Sometimes it's moving. No, it's moving a little bit. Yes, we're sir. using Got old it. cannulas again and again. We're using the same. They don't yeah. have the same. That's a good learning point. What okay. sir has mentioned that could be a mechanism. Can I ask uh, Dr. Hassan Motada your thoughts on this, please? Um, yes, uh, I think uh, me most probably this is due to slippage of cannula under the uh, parts plan epithelium, and um, and this may be due to the something direction of the cannula. So at uh, an instant. The tip tipped under the first plan epithelium, and it induced um, the detachment. And uh, I think the tremors of the retina may be a sign of this uh, uh, of this uh, slippage. Uh, this also may occur during the indentation of the era for a reason or another. Uh, so uh, the, and and the, the the escape of the fluid uh, just be by removing the cannula and inserting it in more empty space and disappearance of the subretinal fluid, I think this is explained by the uh, either a too slanting direction of the uh, either of the cannula, and uh, once it is corrected, the subretinal fluid. I think uh, the, I, I don't I don't think there is a break because if there is a break, the fluid continues to come uh, in, under the retina and the Point well taken, sir. Thank you. One last one comment. comment. Uh, you mentioned about anatomic irregularity. Sometimes which can be little anterior, can be little larger, and especially if your if direction of your cannula insertion is uh, you know more angulated, hook that which is base, cause this kind of detachment of which is base, and like uh, the past plane epithelium, it will seep in. Moment you shift cannulas, the pressure direct differential goes, everything settles back. Okay, so, there are a lot of running much. points here. The possible mechanism, as mentioned by Dr. Dinesh Talwar and Bahasan Mata, is during surgery, probably momentarily the, uh, the infusion cannula might have slipped underneath the uh, parsplan epithelium and then connected the fluid into the subretinal space. And then subsequently, when it was removed, so the track was persisting and it went out. So, we have the next presentation, please, Dr. Prithvi. Morning, one and all. 
I thank VRSA for the opportunity. Right. I'll be presenting on the surgical outcomes of uh, retinal detachment associated with FEVR. I have no financial disclosures. The incidence of RD in FEVR is about 21 to 64% in literature. It's mostly either ecmatogenous or uh, tractional. On reviewing literature, studies haven't compared uh, anatomical outcomes between different surgical techniques based on PVR grade in FEVR RD eyes. So the objective of my study was to analyze the anatomical outcomes of different surgical techniques for FEVR associated retinal attachment. This was a retrospective case series enrolling 31 eyes of 27 patients with FEVR enrolled between Jan 2016 and December 2021. These are my inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the eyes were classified into TRD and RRD. TRD eyes underwent PPV. The RDIs, eyes with PVR less than grade C, underwent either a scleral buckle or PPV, depending on the configuration of the RD and location of the break. Eyes with PVR more than grade C, underwent either PPV plus minus buckle or a two-stage surgery, depending on the surgeon's discretion. Emphasizing more on the two-stage surgery, during the first stage, uh, we go ahead with the routine steps of any RD surgery, just that after a fluid air exchange, the vitreous cavity is filled with PFCL and topped up with 2 ml of silicone oil, and the patient is uh, advised 5 to 7 days of supine position. 5 to 7 days later, the second stage is done, wherein the oil is removed and the PFCL is removed, followed by fluid air exchange and esotamponade. Visual acuity and retinal reattachment rates were assessed at the final visit after single surgery and multiple surgeries. So the mean age of the study was 16.55 uh, years, ranging from 4 to 34 years, with a male predominance. PCVA improved overall, although the difference was not significant. Median follow-up was 18 months. Coming to the staging, uh, 29 out of 31 eyes were either in stage 4A or 5A, while we had one eye each in stage 4B and 5B of FEVR, according to Kashani et al. We had three eyes with TRD that underwent PPV with endotamponade, and uh, the remaining 28 eyes were RRD, with equal numbers in both PVR groups. Out of the 14 eyes with PVR less than grade C, we had seven eyes that underwent buckle and seven eyes which underwent PPV. Out of the remaining 14 eyes with PVR more than grade C, six eyes underwent buckle width, three eyes underwent PPV, and five eyes underwent two-stage surgery. So coming to the eyes with TRD, all the eyes we could achieve anatomical success without any resurgery at the last follow-up. The eyes with RRD and PVR less than grade C, the anatomical success did not improve significantly from 64.3% to 92.85% with multiple surgeries. However, in eyes with advanced PVR, it did improve significantly from 42% after primary surgery to 64.3% after multiple surgeries. And overall, the success improved from 53% to 78% with multiple surgeries with a median of one surgery ranging from 1 to 7 in these eyes with FEVR retinal attachment. The overall anatomical success did not differ significantly between buckle and PPV in eyes with PVR grade less than C. However, the difference in anatomical success did approach statistical significance when a two-stage surgery was employed in eyes with advanced PVR and a poor presenting visual acuity. Coming to the complications, the most common complications noted were secondary glaucoma in 10 eyes managed well with AGM and we had 13 eyes with reattachment after primary surgery. The pre-op picture of 11-year-old child in stage 4A the superior RD with the falciform fold across the macula. POD1 after the second after the first stage uh, with the falciform fold well flattened, retina well attached as seen on OCT and the PFCL in situ. Seven days later, the second stage done and this was POD1 with laser marks visible, retina well attached and the falciform fold flattened as seen on. The anatomical success was better with the two-stage surgery in comparison to PPV plus minus buckle in eyes with advanced PV. PFCL is ideally suited to manipulation of retina and displacing SRF into vitreous cavity due to its high specific gravity, low viscosity and optical transparency. It helps iron out the retina and flatten falciform fold. Post-operative short-term PFCL tamponade is best suited for inferior detachments with severe PVR, wherein prone positioning is cumbersome in children. Two-stage surgery can help avoid buckle-related complications like induced refractive error, extracorridal hemorrhage and infection or erosion of the explant. On reviewing literature, ours was the only study, apart, only recent study, apart from the one by Sen et al. in 2018, that incorporated a significant number of eyes with PVRC, with our study additionally analyzing uh, different anatomical outcomes between different surgical techniques, including a two-stage surgery. So to conclude, surgical management of FEVR-associated attachment is technically challenging, evidenced by lower anatomical success rates for single surgery. However, multiple surgeries might help improving anatomical outcome and preserving visual function, although visual recovery can be limited by amblyopia and reproliferation. So two-stage surgery is definitely a viable option for complicated RD with advanced PVR, especially with inferior attachments and in pediatric age group, where compliance to prone positioning is always a challenge in these. Nice. Uh, <clears throat> 
presentation Prithvi. So, was the two stage uh, procedure uh, restricted to some particular subgroup of the eyes or it was like a random as any FEVR which uh, gets into the surgery you will decide okay this I will go for primary and this will combine and then stage. Eyes with PVR uh, grade more than C, we go ahead with the uh, buckle bit but uh, off late we have started doing this two stage approach. More so we see intraop if you feel the retina doesn't settle well and eyes with these falciform folds and we feel uh, two stage is giving a better outcome. Irrespective of whether the the the, the, the fibrovascular tissue inferior or the temporal you take it for uh, stage yes and more so when the presenting visual acuity is uh, poor. Uh, I'll ask the first question to Rikanshree ma'am so what's your thought on this? Uh, good study but I think it's a very diverse cohort that you have got. Uh, so, for example, you have done only scleral buckle in uh, RRD uh, cases of FEVR. So, obviously, it must have been a break which is not connected to the FEVR. Uh, it must be some you know, uh, uh, a break which is, uh, you know, uh, I mean to say not because of the FEVR. It must have been another normal regmatogenous pathology where you could settle the retina just with buckle. So, I think um, it might be a you know good idea to group aside and just. Uh, uh, analyze the other group where you have done combined with buckle and other group. Uh, Dr. Raju Reddy sir, comments on this. What will be your preferred choice cases with FEV? Buckle alone or vitrectomy? Your thoughts on this two step procedure? on the buckle. Sometimes there is a traction on the fold which break is there in that area. It might those cases I would not prefer a buckle there. Might add a buckle along with it. What I would choice would be. I tell you don't do a two stage procedure. So I for help the kids I'd want to give it two cases. Manish your thoughts on this? The choice of uh Guys, for FEVR cases, a single procedure typically, but uh, I'm not against the idea of using PFCL for uh, any pediatric age group. Uh, if a challenge is an FEVR has its own challenge with action as well as the adherent vitreous, and also positioning, as he said, you know, all these things do we do face, you know, with single procedures, uh, patients come back with the issue. So, I think one has to look at uh, larger number and long term results, but it's a very good option to have. And Murthy sir? I would uh, get a buckle weight for a, because there is a lot of tractional component even if there is a regma I think there is an additional traction component which will always be there but I, I mean this is uh, I have not tried out a two stage procedure but I think we do it in trauma so I think probably it has a similar role in this. Harish? I am the co-author of this paper so I cannot comment. Only point I would like to make is uh, don't do, you can say, categorical prophylactic laser barrage for the. But you have to do any prophylaxis, go for prophylactic buckle because all the cases that we have done barrage have gone in for. Question I mean, what the level of the fill was seen uh, below the inferior. So, is, what kind of fill do you do? Because normally I would do a full fill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, is it a full no, fill? No, in this case, I think it was a slightly underfilled. Okay. Actually, 80 percent, 20 percent, 80 percent PFCL and 20 percent oil. Right. But somehow, in this case, it was uh, underfill. Dr. Hassan Matada, your comments on this, please. Uh, choice of surgery for FEVR. Uh, well, the idea of two stage surgery, I think it is becoming more acceptable um, in PFCL uh, and then at another stage, removing PFCL and replace it with silicon oil or remove it when the stable. I do not believe that the skeletal buckle uh, would any of the posterior report traction. Um, and I'm doing only skeletal buckle um, when I'm doing skeletal buckle alone, not with the um, I have no experience with the stage surgery, but uh, in other cases, I do um, notch dissection as could safely be done. And the concept of putting PFCL and its on fixed retinal folds and flattening of this uh, really I uh, revised. So I don't think PFCL alone can flatten a fixed 
uh, retinal. So my experience with advanced cases of fever, they are difficult cases to manage. Uh, I do as much dissection, safely is done without creating retinal breaks. And um, I try to use silicon oil or air or gas, uh, whatever, uh, whatever, whenever it is. Thank you for comments. Akshok Lass, please, one yeah, last comment. So I have some experience actually in the uh, two-stage procedure or uh, you can call it one stage. Depending on, uh, so I agree with the concept. The first thing to understand is, like silicon oil, EFCL does not allow uh, pre-retinal proliferation under it. So that's a very important concept. EFCL secondly incre increase oxygenation of the retina. And third thing, as he said, that, uh, whether it's inferior or even slightly below the horizontal meridian uh, PR, this does not increase under PFCL. So that's the most important thing. If you have an eye where the fibrotic folds cannot be removed, PFCL does help. One in flattening the fold, second in on not aggravating the pre-existing proliferation, which happens under uh, silicon oil all the time. So the only digression I have is I leave the entire eye filled with the PFCL, the inferior PVR, and there is no need for having uh, two uh, uh, tamponades actually, and that itself helps. So may maybe you have tried that also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The planning point here is the accepted treatment even now is a buckle with vitrectomy because buckle alone may not be sufficient some traction element on the uh, macula, so the membranes. And uh, yeah, two-step procedure, interesting, but more data is needed because we don't know what kind of effect a PFCL can have in young guys. In older eyes, in traumatic, traumatic eyes, we do have enough data. This might need a larger study. Outcome. Uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Rushik, please. At the outset, uh, I want to thank VRSI for this opportunity. Uh, as we all know, external uh, limiting membrane band has been noted on the OCT to extend within the walls, while ellipsoid zone band may stop at the edge. We noticed absence of both the bands ELM as well as EZ in, a, in the walls of a FTMH who achieved type 1 closure following vitrectomy. On uh, reviewing literature, we found out uh, many images with absence of both the bands in the walls of FTMH, but this find is, uh, this finding was ignored. So, with a purpose to identify the absence of ELM and EZ bands together known as indistinct retinal outer layers, the uh, walls of idiopathic full thickness macular oval and its uh, circumferential extent on OCT and as well as to correlate the relationship between circumferential extent of eye roll and its surgical outcome we did a retrospective observational study in which the eyes who had undergone uh, standard uh, vitrectomy with uh, conventional internal ILM peeling and gas tamponade for idiopathic FTMS and having minimum three months of follow-up period were included. Eyes with uh, uh, FTMS having undergone vitrectomy with ILM insertion uh, following I ILM peeling was excluded. FTMS were evaluated uh, using swap source OCT well radius scan protocol of nine. 9 millimeter. These scans were evaluated by two trained retina specialists. Uh, macula was divided in the four quadrant. Each each quadrant gets six scans. So for uh, a supranasal quadrant, if any uh, 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 one to six scan has uh, a presence of eye roll in the mark or uh, oval area, uh, the uh, eye roll was documented is as present in quadrant one. Similarly, eye roll in other quadrants were documented in all the eyes. Baseline derived macular hole indices were calculated uh, three month post operatively type of hole closure, oval architecture and outer retinal layer restoration were documented. Fisher exit test was used to correlate uh, preoperative circumferential extent of eye roll and outcome of, surg as outcome of surgery such that oval architecture and ELM restoration. Pearson correlation coefficient was used to uh, for correlation between circumferential extent of eye roll with derived hole indices. Uh, the uh, study included nine eyes of eight patients with uh, age of mean age of 64 years. All the holes were large with minimum one quadrant of eye roll. All holes achieved type one closure with improvement in BCVA. Uh, these are the illustrative images. Uh, you can see the eye roll in present in the walls of uh, FTMH in two quadrants and these are the uh, uh, post-operative status of ELM and EZ bands. 
these are the uh, pre, pre and post operative OCT scan of all the nine eyes. Uh, regular foveal architecture was achieved in six eyes out of nine eyes. Out of six eyes, five eyes had uh, eye roll in, uh, present in more than two quadrant. All the six eyes achieved restoration of ILM. Uh, regular foveal ar architecture was not uh, was not achieved in three eyes where ELM was not restored. Uh, six eyes that uh, that ELM uh, if with ELM restoration, five eyes had complete ELM restoration, in which uh, four eyes had eye roll uh, present in uh, more than two quadrant. A complete restoration of ELM was associated with complete restoration of ellipsoid zone in two of the aforementioned four eyes. Three eyes uh, didn't uh, uh, get uh, regular foveal architecture as well as ELM restoration and uh, EZ restoration. There was a positive uh, a correlation between eye roll and tra tractional uh, whole index and uh, negative correlation between iron and uh, whole diameter ratio. Uh, disruption of uh, Muller cell cone following anterior uh, post anterior posterior traction is the primary event that uh, uh, in the FTMH formation. Outer processes of uh, Muller cells uh, they are key in the for uh, FTMH formation as well as FTMH closure and ELM uh, formation. Uh, the ELM uh, regenerates first followed by outer nuclear layer and followed last the uh, ellipsoid zone restores. So we presume eye roll in the walls of FTMH reflect the changes in the Muller cells. Circumferential extent of eye roll provides better estimate, uh, better estimate of the activity uh, in the Muller cells and uh, this may explain relationship between uh, eye roll having uh, in more than two quadrant and achieving regular foveal architecture. Current derived macular row indices don't take into account the restorative biological process. Retrospective nature, small sample size, lack of FTMH having uh, distinct outer retinal layers and uh, lack of long term follow up were uh, some of our uh, limitations. So to conclude preoperative circumferential extent of eye roll in the walls of FTMH can be a, a potential predictive biomarker for a restoration of foveal architecture as well as ELM restoration. This uh, finding need to be confirmed by uh, more studies. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, we are pleased that uh, this uh, our research has been published in IGO uh, December uh, issue uh, yesterday only. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks for that uh, presentation. So this was a retrospective study, right? Yes. Yes. But uh, in that particular, even in that retrospective study, was there a matching done between no. like you so that the whole size? Or the uh, whole indi uh, the other factors were taken care of. only in those it was measured not done you didn't try to match the other factors no 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 sir what is your thought on this I think that's a very important point now unless we take all these factors together on the size of macular hole and all that and the chronicity of it I think it becomes very difficult to comment on those two points of the I mean I would have looked everything into consideration. I know the results are based a lot on that. I think and is when get here an elevation at that edge the ocular hole that will change the whole angulation with which the light hits laser hits the layers might not be able to assess it early whether that layer is available or not. Get the OCT Scans in the first one we have shown there's a height elevation. Whole thing is hyper reflective. That's because you can't identify that. That a laser light will go ILM like this. It creates like this angle. But you're measuring. Where are you measuring? Only in this part you are measuring, and that the angulation is. Can you observe? Many of the, the uh, one side wall has a clear uh, ELM band in the uh, uh, FTMH wall, while on the same other side, on the opposite side, uh, there is a uh, in, uh, ELM band. Yeah, what Rajesh is trying to reiterate is in an uh, that in particular cases there will be some edema, and the the findings cannot may not be reproducible. What I may feel as an industry player, the other because it's not very well defined. Yes, in future if you do a a, a, a prospective study with larger right. size and then define this particular entity. Define this particular entity in terms of reflectivity, in terms of uh, structure, then probably this can become a marker. Dr. Naresh and Dr. Shriman, comments on this? Uh, 
actually i feel your yeah, interesting concept but again as i agree with rajiv with it mostly likely to be associated because of the reflectivity of the oct different angulations so i think it would be good to have some histopathological uh, studies if you can have or some animal studies where you can actually see histopathologically how are the outer layers in that uh, edge of the hole because i have never ever seen a macular hole with some distinct outer layers in that uh, edge always indistinct so uh, may be good to have some uh, histopathology one thing is whenever you do a different oc scans there is a little angulation here at that angulation changes with scan itself there's even the movement of the eye and things like that that actually makes a difference in reflectivity also so that you can actually one change the angulation and look at whether that is actually happening one last comment from dr asan motrada please your thoughts on this um, so I, i agree that it is difficult to judge on the limiting membrane or ellipsoids integrity um, from the oct and as stated um, i think um, this cannot be taken as a parameter for uh, the closure and the uh, restoration of visual acuity um, except by doing a historical uh, uh, study so i think or with the more advancement of the uh, oct technology and maybe uh, is possible just to be taken into consideration thank you so thank you for the comment dr vivek can you come on so the learning point here is uh, as uh, all the panelists agree that yes it is an interesting predict uh, the marker it can be in future but uh, provided there is some more data on it as a prospective study and then we match the other factors which are uh, all the, the predictive factors which are already available and then probably is accepted thank you dr akrave please thank you dr madhu uh, i'll be presenting a case uh, titled what went wrong It was uh, a 40 year old male uh, post corneal tear repair elsewhere 2 months ago was diagnosed as uh, inoperable uh, retinal detachment and referred to us for for the management this is what the eye looked like at presentation there was a repaired corneal tear uh, status post penetrating injury and uh, though indistinct the fundus photograph uh, shows us uh, retinal detachment with sort of incarceration of the uh, retina at around uh, 10 o'clock uh, 11 o'clock keeping this in mind i started off uh, with the surgery uh, just first to realize that uh, the corneal tear had its sutures uh, removed elsewhere apparently pretty early the wound was still good looking scar it was raw it was open so i had to first go ahead and uh, repair the corneal tear uh, again so something little unexpected in uh, usually in uh, cases where there is an incarceration or there is a trauma i prefer putting a belt so a belt goes in then uh, the vitrectomy starts and uh, if you look at the fold so the retina there is folded it is a pretty mobile fold by this time it's on my mind at once i release the incarceration uh, and settle the retina with pfcl largely things uh, should be fine and that is how it proceeds uh, whatever was the peripheral vitreous there uh, i cleared it up uh, released the incarceration and uh, started flattening the uh, retina under uh, the pfcl by this time what is going on in my thoughts is i don't expect anything to go wrong and uh, yeah i have a nice video now to possibly show management of an incarceration and then suddenly this happens out of the blue there is a uh, hemorrhage which uh, comes in i had to inject pfcl all the hemorrhage goes back i am again able to uh, sort of you know see the uh, entire vitreous cavity uh, the fold didn't open up completely i made some radial incisions there again to ensure that it opens up but moment i attempt to remove the pfcl again again the bleed comes in every time i remove uh, the pfcl the blood used to come in again and it as you can see was pretty fresh and uh, no it was like an arterial uh, bleeding there so i had to finally leave pfcl inside do a 360 degree endo laser and this is what the eye looked like uh, with pfcl in c2 decent fine but what exactly happened what went wrong so I go back to the video and i see this is what had happened so there was this small air bubble that came in so i take my cutter sort of trying to remove the air bubble there and i entangle the choroid and 
as you can see the choroid just shears off this is uh, what happened in a split second initially i did not realize it is when i went back to the video to see what happened i uh, realized this is uh, what had occurred then going ahead uh, i removed the pfcl replaced it with oil and uh, then the patient largely did well the question here was uh, why did it happen was it a predisposed eye because uh, there was trauma maybe the peripheral choroid was uh, little congested was there a pre existing injury that i did not pick up or was it just uh, you know overconfidence it's one of those cases where things are going fine or was i in a hurry this was the 10th case along the day so maybe i wanted to wrap up things quickly so just uh, food for thought uh, of uh, sudden choroidal bleeding that uh, occurred on table thank you thanks for that interesting case dr vivek so how many days post op was it after the corneal tear uh, this was 2 uh, months uh, post injury so for the cornea actually to be open 2 months uh, i am not able to explain that this patient underwent a routine suture removal and i don't know whether the wound uh, integrity there was not very good did the pressure in the orbit due to the block uh, predispose it to open up slightly i'm not very sure about it what was the b scan finding in this was that the detachment only uh, the temporal or nasal also there was some scar tissue uh, or some retinal the b scan uh, i think we had not done here because uh, the fundus was visible we were able to see it visually along with the fundus photograph so unfortunately uh, we don't have a b scan here i'll open up with our wise counsel now uh hemant murthy sir your thoughts on this i i i agree that you know when you saw that the corneal wound is open so i think some amount of hypotony must have occurred and caused the choroid to become thickened and that's why you got caught and that's the you know, Right. But injuries are fairly, you know, common to see this condition that you know the choroid tends to, I mean, because it's already very congested. Right. More so in the recent uh, trauma, but yours is two months. But I think the corneal wound being open is probably the cause. Also possible intraoperatively because the corneal wound was being repaired. Hypotony might have induced localized choroidal detachment. Also, Dr. Narish. Given a multiple choice, actually, I'll go for option C and D. What <laughs> happens? <sir. laughs> okay. <laughs> we are in a hurry and we are overconfident. in the right side in the study when we are doing a, a vicious space just to make a nick in the choroid or uh, some of the past planner start uh, oozing a lot of time for us what is that uh, option c also should dr hasan e, cnd yeah dr hasan what are your comments on this please yes uh, i think uh, this uh, was a choroidal hemorrhage and uh, it was obvious as he uh, removed the uh, the blood from under the retina on the nasal side it uh, seems that it comes from the uh, from the choroid and i think this uh, happened during as he said during removal of the air bubble blindly so i think it is due to uh, maybe overconfidence or, or uh, he was in a hurry to see uh, because the air bubble was obscuring the view but uh, this it is probably due to a choroidal uh, injury which is um, common in these eyes as because the choroid is congested and um, unless you stop the choroidal bleed will continue uh, to flow into the vitreous cavity obscuring the and when he injected the pfcl um, maybe it cleared the vitreous cavity and the sub uh, of the subretinal space from the blood uh, but uh, the cause i think is choroidal choroidal trauma trauma to the thank you sir uh, dr manish and dr rajiv reddy i think uh, uh, basically just a touch which has caused it and it happens uh, in trauma where the choroid is already inflamed and more likely to happen so it's not that common to have happened i think what's important here is that you've shown how to manage it a perfectly well managed because this is a situation which may as dr narish also said difficult to diathermize sometimes you can't find the place and Uh, only ways to raise pressure put pfcl and uh, tried removing it once back so it came back uh, and then it does well so i think it's more important to see uh, how you managed although in your hands i would i would have seen this case with an endoscope inside it <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, a very uh, nicely managed and as uh, raknaresh said all your multiple choice picked probably a bit of pre predisposing factor probably a bit of intraoperative hypotony inducing choroid but ultimately the surgeons If I can quickly ask, uh, maybe Rajiv or anyone, would anyone?
have managed it any different? Could I have done anything different, or uh, that is what That's we could have at that time? No, I don't think. On table, if you wait for some time, say I will give it five minutes, say coronal bleeding can stop. You already have the PFCL inside. Maybe you can raise the intraocular pressure even more. It will stop after some time. So, you don't need to keep the LPFC second stage. For the want of Thank time, we will conclude this session. So, there's a lot of learning. Uh, in the first uh, case, we, th we saw how uh, we can prevent the instrument touch uh, to remember that eye is uh, not flat surface and uh, have a, an adequate magnification. The second case, anti uh, uh for an ROP inducing a macular hole, yes. We need to be vigilant, especially in uh, anti for ROP cases. And then curious case of fluid dynamics, the uh, instrumentation, when we reuse the instruments or non well cannulas, we need to be aware of the dynamics, otherwise a simple, pretty simple, straightforward case can become a little complica complicated. And the PVD induced GRT by Dr. Gopal Pillai, uh, that was uh, the vision cannula, momentarily seeding into the Bartlano. We do see in, uh, in cases where we have eyes with the short papillary fissure, one has to be aware of it. And then the two free papers were presented, which have been discussed for FEVR and uh, the, uh, the macular hole where the one was a retrospective study and needs uh, further more clarification. So on the behalf of VRSI and our scientific chair, Dr. Mahesh Shanbhagam, I thank Dr. Hassan Motada for giving his uh, insight, uh, his, his comments on this and taking his time out to uh, be on this program. Can I have a round uh, lot of applause, please? So, uh, Dr. Hassan, please stay there. We will take a photo uh, with all this uh, moderators and this thing. I thank all the vice council and the uh, VRSI scientific committee chairman and the organizing committee for this opportunity and the audience. Without you, this wouldn't have been a successful work. Thank you.